welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number 21, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on October 13th, 2005. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, makers of Battleground Fantasy Warfare, the miniature war game without miniatures. To learn more about Your Move Games or to take a flash demo of Battleground, please visit www.yourmovegames.com. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. All right, well, hello and welcome to the Dice Tower. This is Tom Vassell speaking. And it's been a while since we've recorded our last show. And during the holiday season here, I got pretty sick, I think. Uh, when we recorded our last show, I was in between being sick, and you can hear my voice start going in the episode itself. And it's been gone for a few weeks, and it's still not back completely. But it's back enough, and you know, it's been ages since I put out one of these classic episodes, and I thought this would be a good thing to do. Don't worry about the regular show. It will be back next week. I already have it finished because what we're doing for the next two shows, and I'll put them back-to-back over the week, and maybe, if you're lucky, there might be three of them. It depends on how long each one is. Uh, is I've interviewed several publishers. I believe the number is 15 different publishers about what they plan to do in 2009. And so they're not very long interviews, but put them together. And I got a lot of the big names, a lot of interesting news. And so you can look forward to those over the next couple of weeks. Well, let's get to this show. We'll start it up, and near the end I have some comments about the show itself. Dice Tower episode number 21. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about card games, war games, Euro games, miniatures, but most of all, board games. Your hosts are Tom Vassell, internet reviewer extraordinaire, and Joe Stedman, vocal war game enthusiast. More about the Dice Tower can be found on the web at www.thedicetower.com. And now, here's your hosts, Tom and Joe. All right, this is Tom Vassell. And this is Joe. <laughs> no, right, he has no last name, he's just... I'm Joe. So now we're in our 20s, this is episode 21. Wow, um, we're, we're legal now, we're 21. <laughs> we're glad to have you on board. Uh, we have uh, more questions than normal today, fewer segments, and our our top 10 party games. Yeah, uh, Joe's gonna, exciting. Joe's going to talk more about his contest about Fire in the Sky, uh, something that I don't know a whole lot about. Yeah, we're Fire in the Sky. Is it Fire in the Sky Lightning? Yeah, right. It's uh, affectionately known as FITS by Wargamers. Fire in the Sky is put up by Multi-Man Publishing. Um, it's actually a Japanese game that's been republished into English. And it's uh, pretty popular. It's been getting a lot of good reviews. It's the must-have Pacific Theater World War II game. And uh, We would like to uh, say hi to all those people who this is the first episode you've ever heard. If you've never uh, played many board games... And you are in for a treat. Uh, well, not from our show necessarily, but from playing board games. And so you might want to play war games like Joe would recommend, or any other game but a war game, which is what I would recommend. <laughs> so you can also check us out at our website. Mine's www. Actually, just go to the www.thedicetower.com. No, the dice tower. As I said, I said the. What did I say? The. Yeah. Oh, whatever, dude. Anyway, the <laughs> the 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 whatever dicetower.com, and on that page you'll find a link to my my blog, and a link to Tom's uh, conglomerate of stuff. Maybe I should register the dice tower. The dice tower. I'm from the Midwest. <laughs> so anyway, we're in the middle of a contest. We do try to do a. Uh, a free game giveaway every two weeks, and this is the middle episode of a game contest. It's a war game. We talked about a little bit just now from Multi Man Publishing. We'd like to thank Multi Man Publishing for supporting us, and we hope that uh, you'll thank them too for being part of the show. And what is? And why don't you talk about the contest a little bit, just? So oh yeah, okay. Let me, let me. We have a lot of questions about the actual contest itself. Um, we're going to be very generous on your uh, your your guesses. There, there's three ways that you can get. Uh, entered in the contest. So technically your name can be put in three times. Uh, the first way is to identify the three largest uh, or the three battles in history that are the most represented in, in war games. So you could say the Battle of um, 
Fallen Timbers, which is not one of them, or the Battle of Tippecanoe, which is not one of them, or, you know, whatever, the Battle of... What's a good Star Trek battle, Tom, or Star Wars? <laughs> I don't... <laughs> the Battle of Endor. The Battle of Endor, which is definitely not one of them. So that's the first way. And if you get the right three, I'll give you an entrance. The second entrance that you can get is by naming the three large areas or battles... Uh, not battles, but the three major wars or areas of time, you know, time periods that have been that have been gamed. So, for instance, for that, you could put something like the Seven Years' War, which is not one of them. Or you could put an area of time, you could say science fiction, <laughs> which is not one of them. Whatever. Oh, just give away all the wrong answers now. Well, I'm trying to help everybody out. And the third way you can get your name entered is uh, if you give us a creative uh, tagline. Me and Tom were joking that we don't have a tagline. You know, something that's funny to say. We got some pretty funny ones so far. We'll have to. And we got we got several that weren't funny at all. <laughs> we'll try to go. I think next week we'll go through those. I'd like to see what people think of them. We can have you guys tell us. Yeah, what you if, think. if we don't use yours, please don't be offended. We're very very picky. And I was feeling very generous. And uh, if you enter, if you even try, you could say the three battles were the Battle of Catan, the Battle of. Tigris and Euphrates and the Battle of whatever, I'll still give you one entrance total for trying. So the way this works is, if you enter at all, you get one entry. Yes. If you do all three things correctly, you get three entries. Yes. Um, what we'll do then is we'll take all the entries, and then next week, Joe will bring in an actual dice tower. An actual dice tower, thus the name of the dice tower. And we will roll dice. And we'll right, we'll have, have a list of everyone's names under numbered, and we'll just roll them. See and what happens. The winner will get the free game for Multiman Publishing. Mail to their house. So you have uh, about six days from when this episode is aired to get these answers in so that we can compile it. Your answers are due by the um, noon Eastern Standard Time in America on the 25th of uh, October. Yep. And uh, next week we'll have another contest for you. So I'm pretty excited about this. Contest, contest, contest. Do you want to give Christmas any, is coming. any clues about the next contest? Uh, no, I don't because I'm not sure which. We have two two that are flip-flopping around. Um, one of them has something to do with a sport, and the other has something to do with a war game. Maybe not a war game, but maybe a war game. Maybe not a war game. All right. Well, that might give it away for people that have listened to our previous <laughs> Yeah. And it, it, previous oh, are you talking about that simulation game? Uh, <laughs> yes, it is a simulation game. Yeah, right. <laughs> Whatever. Right. You and Walt are in the agreement here. Anyway, okay. Walt's someone, or one of our friends. Well, each episode we do a review of a board game, and my board game this week is Walk the Dogs. Now, you may not have seen Walk the Dogs in your store. Uh, it came out this year, 2005, uh, because it's not distributed in stores. It's actually distributed by Simply Fun. Simply Fun is a company that I would compare to Tupperware or to Amway. <laughs> oh, I want to rush out and get me some Tupperware. Yeah, well, well. Well, don't, don't, don't smash Tupperware. We're, aren't we drinking out of Tupperware cups here? I think we are. <laughs> yeah, well, so the basic idea of Simply Fun is where a representative comes to your house and they throw a game party. And the games are really sim- simple, easy to learn. You can learn them in five minutes or so. I have five of these games, and they're all very, very easy to learn. All five of them I've played now, and all five of them I, I, I enjoy. They're, they're not, they're not going to be any great uh, strategic Tactical Fest, but they're all Simple Fun. Oh, that's the name of the company, Simply Fun. Anyway, uh, you can check out their website and see if there's a representative near you. I think having a party at your house will be pretty cool, especially since you don't have to plan half of it. And you can get free games just for having these people come. Um, but the game we're talking about today, anyway, now that I've done that intro, is Walk the Dogs. It's designed by Alan Moon and Aaron Weisbloom, a team of uh, game designers that's given us some really good games, including Capital and, of course, Al Moon is designer of that most famous game, Ticket to Ride. Walk the Dogs has what I think are some of the coolest components ever. There's a pile of dogs that comes in the game. There's 63 of them, and they're nice, plastic, uh, miniature dogs. They're really nice. I mean, there's six different kinds of them, and you put them up on the table in this big, long row, and it winds around in the middle of the table like a big S. And all those dogs are there of the different types. Then each player is dealt two cards. On your turn, you draw a card, and then you play a card. It's very simple. The card that you play lets you do a couple options. You can take a couple of the dogs from the front of the line, one to three, depending on what the card says. You can take some cards, dogs from the back of the line, one to three. Or you can steal a card from someone else's line. I mean, not a card, a dog. Whenever you get dogs, you put them in your own line in front of you. But you can only add them to the front of the back. 
What you're trying to do is trying to get the same dogs in groups together in your line. One dog is worth one point, but if you have two dogs together, they're worth four. Three dogs together are worth, uh, I think, nine, four dogs more. And if you ever get five dogs of the same type together, then you win the game. But you have to be careful because anytime someone draws a dog catcher card, they play it immediately, and each player loses the largest group of dogs of the same kind at either the front or the end of your line. So if I have four dogs at the front of my line and I'm waiting, trying to get that fifth dog to win the game, I can lose them all. Or I could put a different type dog in front of them to keep them safe from any dog catcher. And that's not a hard decision. So you put the, it's like a war game. You it's kind of like push your luck. You put the, uh, the mangy dog, the mutt up front on point, and if he gets killed, you know, <laughs> the rest of the pack can make it. Kind of. But by doing that, you are taking a chance of getting fewer points. If I have three dogs together, do I try to get the fourth dog, which gives me a whole lot more points? Or do I just put another dog there so that I don't take that chance of losing the dogs? Also, occasionally, you'll draw a bone card, and a bone card is given to the player with, who currently has the fewest dog, and those bone cards are worth three points at the end of the game. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of the bone cards, but they do keep the scores closer at the end. Either way, the components are incredible. Gameplay is simple, it takes 30 minutes or less to play, and it's great. My five-year-old daughter can play it. Her strategy wasn't the greatest, but she did understand how to play cards and take it. Um, my, my teenagers I played it would love it. I'm looking very much forward to introducing it to groups of adults who are just there to play a simple, fun game. Uh, Walk the Dogs, I highly recommend it. Hmm. It does look kind of cool with all those little dogs. Yeah, I mean, the box is just full of them. <laughs> Good to my son, he can play with them. All right, the game that I'm going to do this week is it's a filler game. It's a very light. It's a card game. It goes by the name Mag Blast, and this is actually I'm going to talk about Mag Blast, the second edition. Um, it's, Which I think is the only one we've ever played. We've only played the other one, but I've read a lot about the first edition. Oh, okay. Um, it's fantasy flight games put out by Christian Peterson. It's also credited, I think, probably to his brother. I'm not really sure who Anders Peterson is. It's only his only credit, so I imagine it's his brother or his son. I have no idea. Anyway, it's like I said, it's a filler game, 20 minutes, science fiction theme. Um, and it's based out of the universe of Twilight Imperium. So if you're familiar with Twilight Imperium, or, you know, this had the third edition come out, it's the same species and all this. And what it is, it's an outer space spaceship fighting game. Uh, you can play all the way up to eight players, but I've never played with more than four. It just seems like it'd be too chaotic. What you do is that you have your deck of cards, and you have different types of cards. You have ship cards and action cards. And you have your flagship card, which is also your species. You randomly determine what species you're going to be, and each species has a special ability kind of like in uh, Twilight Imperium, and you play this card in front of you, and then you have the four quadrants, north, south, east, and west, or the four points, and you randomly draw four ship cards, and you put one card in each of your four areas. And then on your turn, you're basically attempting to destroy the other player or player's flagship. You can play teams if you'd like. <coughs> and you just you you can only shoot at the flagship if one of his four areas is clear of protection. So you have to chip away by destroying the smaller ships that are surrounding the flagship first before you can get shots in on the flagship. And, you know, there's a sequence of play, and uh, it, it's pretty pretty cut and dry. I mean, first thing is you, you discard cards. And you drop to five, and uh, after that you draw ships, and you get new ships by playing cards from your hand that have little icons in the corner. You have to have three of a kind, or one of each of the three. There's many. I think there's five different icons that there is, and the the better the card is, the more icons are on the card. So, and then after you draw the ships, you can move your ships around, rearranging them in your four quadrants, and then you finally play your action cards. And you can do this as much as you want, but remembering that if you have no cards in your hand. When the next player comes up, you might not have any cards that you can play in defense because there's defensive cards, too. Um, the game's got really good artwork. Um, I really like the artwork, and it's just it's a lot of fun. Um, there's a rule in the game that says that you have to make laser noises and boom noises and all that kind of stuff, but I don't really think that most of the time we play that we use that rule. Really? I thought when I played with Joe, he made us do that That's rule. only because you were playing, Tom. He said we had to do it or it <laughs> didn't work. Exactly. The rules, right. the rules say if you don't, if you don't make the noise, then the, the gun misses its target. Anyway, uh, is there no noise in space? I thought. I don't know. So I'll have to look George Lucas. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's it's I highly recommend it. It's just a fun light filler game that you can play, and you can play up to eight players. I'd like to play it once with eight, four on four, like two convoys maybe. I don't know. It'd be fun. 
Uh, you can pick it up pretty cheap, Fantasy Flight. I guess my only complaint about the game is, uh, and I, I've only, I only know this from reading it, but I guess this new version, second edition, the card stock is just much thinner, and they put a black border on the cards. And I know that for a fact that the black border on cards don't ever work well because you can see the wear and tear. Yeah, here. if you're a company and you're thinking about making a card game and you're wondering, white borders or black borders? White borders. Yeah, they, they, definitely they white borders. Card. So they put black borders. But other than that, you know, you always put your cards in card protectors if you wanted to. But anyway, so that's my review of the week. Mag Blast, second edition by Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, the game was put out. You're in, uh, listening. <laughs> Go ahead. The game was put out in 2002. Go ahead, Tom. To the Dice Tower at www.thedicetower.com with Tom Vassell and Joe Stedman. Oh, I thought you were done, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We have a lot of questions today, so I guess we, we should get into them. Uh, the first one was from Waldo O'Hara, who had a very interesting way. Uh, we had, I think Joe had put Dr. Lucky as my his least, worst game my, of all time. My worst game, uh, we did worst top, our, our least favorite games last week. And uh, my number one was Kill Dr. Lucky or Save Dr. L- Dr. Lucky, same thing. So Walt O'Hara was trying to uh, help Joe out here. So he said that he had a variant for more visual and pal- palatable Dr. Lucky. He said, we're working on doing a miniature version set on the advent of World War I. We're calling it Kill Archduke Ferdinand. <laughs> the Archduke. <laughs> he says, no, I'm not getting, which is good because at this point I assumed he was. <laughs> he says, we're using the Lucky Mansion as the blueprint and changing the gameplay somewhat. The players are World War I era European general types from various nations. The mansion's going to be in 3D with foam core walls. I'm not crazy about the original mechanics either, so I'm just rewriting oh, so it. So why is it? Why is it? So isn't it a whole new game? Well, so exactly. Walt, you know. But Walt will do this probably. He says he'll post pictures. If you ever checked out Waldo Harris' blog. Um, Over on Content World. And he's also got his own blog blog. I think it's Fizznaz or something like that. Yeah, go to my blog and I have a link to it. And he, he really goes into great detail. I just saw he played some fantasy fantasy game with, with uh, tokens and such, and he showed picture by picture of what happened. And, I, you know, people call me a machine, but even I don't have time for that sort of thing. He has no life. No. Maybe he does. Walt, do you have a life? Yes, Walt. Well, answer that question for us. <laughs> but he did have a question for us. Here's his question for Joe. He says, hey, Joe, what historical figure would you most like to game with? Rommel, Patton, Stonewall, no, those, that's actually Those are actually my... I type those in there. Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hang on, let me do it again. Hey, Joe, what historical figure would you most like to war game with? And I put, and I typed in so I wouldn't forget, I typed in some ideas, but these aren't my favorites. I, I was thinking about and I thought, well, Rommel, Patton, Stonewall Jackson, Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Shinzu, or Sun, Sun Tzu, or however you pronounce his name, you know, the Art of War. And I thought those would all be neat. And then I really thought about it, and I thought, you know, here's, here's one for you. I would like to war game with Otto Skarinski. So I, I'm not really sure how to pronounce his name. You know, he's the famous German general, the one that was uh, Operation Grief, you know, from the... He's the one that led the Germans behind enemy lines um, and infiltrated the Americans. He, he had all kinds of... He, he's a... Look him up on the Internet. This guy had an amazing life, and he never... He actually escaped from the American jail. As a POW took off, lived in South America for a while. He, he, he lived an old, rich man. He was a millionaire when he died. And he helped uh, help other people escape from Germany. And he was he was like the the guy they make movies about. And I don't think there's ever been a movie about him, but they should. He's just a really interesting guy, genius, I think. Well, thanks, Walt, for not asking me. But if you had asked me, <laughs> I would have said I would like to. I would have to find out their personalities first, and I would want to play with one who was the the least sore loser. The least sore loser. It wouldn't be Napoleon then. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. It wouldn't be Napoleon. And I'm not sure. It would probably be, it would probably be, uh, Patton would probably get Charles de Gaulle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was mean. All right. The next question is from George Ratcliffe. All right. It says, on your show, you've talked about using a dice tower instead of rolling the dice. Where can I buy one? Do you know any plans where I can download one to try to build it himself? Well, actually, I did some research on this. And as much as it irritates me to, to say this, I think um, the the best place, or or, or a quick place to find one, I, I guess I should say the best place, but a quick place would be Dicetower.com, not the Dice Tower. Just, just Dice Tower. Dice Tower. You know, if this guy would go out of business, I could own that domain. But you know, he actually has uh, some Dice Towers that he built there um, of his Dice Towers, and I think you can I've, buy them from I've, him. I've actually done some research, and I saw there's a lot of places where you can find plans to do Dice Towers out of Legos. Uh, dice towers out of um, 
different things. It doesn't have to be just a dice tower. I've seen some really interesting ones. I saw one where a guy got a, a doll house, like for little Fisher Price toys or whatever, and he glued it together and drilled holes in it and stuff, and he, you can drop the dice down the chimney, and it, it's just kind of cool. But Yeah, uh, Dan Becker, his name is, if you go to his blog, and I don't want to repeat the whole thing on here, just just type in dice tower and google.com, and he, he's one of the first couple links. He's built some really Amazing. nice dice towers. He's uh, out of paper, but he also used those um, those plaster cast brick molds, the things I always say I'm going to buy and that I never do. <laughs> and and he made a dice tower, at, and this is the guy Joe's actually talking about where he put the little bells in. Yeah. So, I mean, his dice tower just looks amazing. So if you have that kind of time and energy, I would say go for it because I think you know, there are be... a few weeks ago we did, a, we did featured websites, and I did uh, the featured website of Mark Pitskavich. Pitskavich, whatever. Anyway, he's an ESL guy. He's got the, uh, on his website, he's got a bunch of pictures of different ASL dice towers because uh, everyone in ASL seems to have a dice tower that they use, and there's some really funny ones. But anyway. Well, good. thanks, George. I hope that helps you out a little bit. Uh, for questions like that, you know, you could always you could always check Google out yourself, but maybe he thought we knew some more about it than, than we It is our, the, our namesake. I would say the dice boot, except it's pretty hard to find right now. You might be able to get some if you go to chessex.com. The, the dice makers, they, yeah, we they, both have, have those. they have the rights to that, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, the next question is from uh, Andy see. Falk. He All has right. another question for Joe. He says, "I currently got first edition ASL and Beyond Valor. I brought them back in the eight, I bought them back in the eighties when I was a young war gamer, but school and work robbed me of the hobby. Now that my interest is rekindling." How important is it to get second edition? Can I continue to play first edition? Well, <laughs> I think the answer says yes. No one's going to stop you, but well, I know what he means. Okay. Can I play first edition against second edition opponents? And then he also wants to know what modules and expansions do you feel are essential to have other than Beyond Valor? All right. Well, for well that's first, a lot of questions. No, actually, it's not. First edition is completely compatible with second edition. It just looks nicer, and they fixed some of the errata. They incorporated the errata, and they and they they've reprinted it. So it's the second edition. You can go back basically the whole lifespan of ASL, 20 years or so, and not really find any major differences in the rules. It's not like uh, Warhammer 40K, where every time they make a new edition of the rules, they completely change the rules. It's basically the same game. So you can use your first edition. I actually own a first edition rulebook and a second edition rulebook, and I let people borrow my first edition rulebook. Um, but I would buy one just because I'm one of those person kind of people that likes to have the new one with all the incorporated new or not that new rules but the fixed rules and things like this and uh what modules and expansions do you feel essential beyond uh besides beyond valor well basically essential i would go with paratrooper get paratrooper for sure you can get that one fairly cheap and it really depends on what nations you want to play if you like playing americans russians and germans you're, you're all set i mean basically there's the the, the Axis and Allied Miners and the British and all that. You can get those if you'd like, but really that's all you need. I would pick up ASL Starter Kit 1 and 2 if you haven't played in a while. I think that just with the, the free maps that you, not the free, but the maps that come included and the new counters and just a simplified game, it's a good way to teach other people and refresh yourself on the rules. It's very cheap, very, very affordable. And so I, I would recommend to get Starter Kit 1 and 2 and Paratrooper, and you should be set. I'd probably pick up a second edition rule book too. Oh, of course. <laughs> Hey, I'm not just saying that because uh, we're doing multi. If you have figured out now, Dice Tower week. has a little subset called also called ASL Shout Squad. <laughs> we get so many ASL questions and stuff. Uh, ASL's like, a big part of ASL Wargaming. ASL big man. I'm not a big man in ASL. I'm just I just know a lot about it compared to most of your typical gamers. All right, our next question is from. No one ever knows everything about ASL. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's probably true. Our next question is from Sanjay Subramanian. Sanjay Subranyan? Oh, right. Subramanian. Okay. I don't know if I put the uh, accent on the right syllable, but I do have the pronunciation right. All right. Now, how do you have the pronunciation right? Because I actually asked him. If you have an odd name and yes, it's a question, if you if, if you get offended if we pronounce it wrong, then just tell us how to pronounce it. And or just, we'll, we'll yeah, it right. write your name phonetically when you send it in. My yeah. name is Phonetic Vassal, but people still spell it wrong continually, continually, continually. Eh, hmm. That's okay. Anyway, his question is, among uh, new games, what is the best game you think out there that costs less than 10 bucks? You give one, I'll give one. We'll both give two. I mean, you got one, uh, two, three. I actually wrote down, uh, down uh, let's see, eight, but I, but I can give the two best. What I did is I went to funagain.com, and I did a advanced search there, and and uh, I found games that cost less than $10. So I know that you can buy the games there. 
Although you should probably buy them at Game Fest, since that's who's hosting our show. Yeah, that's what I was just wondering about, Tom. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, uh, well, I like Board Game Geek, but they don't do a. There's no way to keep prices on there because prices are such a fluctuating thing. Yeah. So anyway, so go ahead and give me your first one. Well, one I would say is David and Goliath. I just talked yeah, about this game. Good recently. game. It's ten dollars or less. Uh, yeah. Wow. I think you can get it for like eight bucks, and that's not too bad. It's a good card game. Hmm. Um, Featuring David fighting Goliath. And I just wrote a review on this game that I posted on the internet, so go read that. Well, I would put uh, down, if you're a war gamer, aspiring war gamer, I'd put uh, Sergeants on the Eastern Front by Lost Battalion Games. It's 8 bucks, brand new. And uh, they have two expansions for it already and a list of scenarios. It's like it's it's a very light uh, squad-level game covering World War II. And uh, I did a review on it uh, in one of our early episodes, so go back and read the archives. Or listen to the archives. <laughs> Uh, another game I would I would say is a good one to get is Coloretto. Coloretto is actually like two years old now, but it's still a really good card game that comes for a very inexpensive price and really looks nice. The cards are shell chameleons changing into different colors, and everyone I've introduced the game to likes it. You, you, you either turn a card over or you take cards. Yeah, it's a fun game. And so it's a good game. I would put uh, Agora or Lightspeed, both from... That company with the... She has. Yeah, that game. I don't like pronouncing their company's name, but anyway. Those are both really good games. Um, what else, Tom? Anything else? Other games that I had mentioned was Monkey Memory, Control Nut, Loot, and Word Jam. All I, games that... They're all card games. Can you get a board game for less than $10? Not too many. But, I mean... You can get a rummage sale. <laughs> <laughs> you can try and find games at rummage sales, but just we, we save your money we should, nice we should do a list. You know, best games you got rummage sales. But, uh... You know, the game I just reviewed, Magblast, you can pick that up for $10 or less, I'm sure. If Maybe. Can... I, I wonder if it's like 15 But either way, it's a good price. Don't limit yourself to $10, folks. Go up to 20 Yeah. Because then you can get ASL Starter Kit. Or if you go up to 30 <laughs> you can get a lot of good games. Yeah, I like the, some of the modules. The next the next questions are from Hans Kischel. He has one for Joe and two for me. Ha-ha. So we'll do Joe's single question first. Uh, Joe Rears was, without choosing, oh, there he goes. from the top three from the contest, what would be the battle and time period that you would most likely to, that you would most like to play a game in? So, without choosing from the top three battles. Oh, I, got, yeah, I, 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 read, I read right over that. Without choosing from the top three that are in the contest? but if right. I, okay, so, uh, so, whatever Joe's answer is, you know it's not one of the three in the contest. Oh, well, I guess I would have to say, um, I, would re- I really like the Battle of Stalingrad. Okay, and I said that would be interesting myself. How about the Polish revolt? You mean with the Jewish, the Jewish guys in the the ghetto? You talking about that? I'm talking about when the Poles thought that this that the, it was near the end of World War II, and they thought that the Russians were going to come in, and so they they yeah yeah that's it. the Jew the Jews in the ghetto, and they basically four or five guys with rifles and handguns was able to tie down a, quite a few Germans. Now, um, no, I, I really like the Battle of Stalingrad, and it's not in the top three games. I also like uh, I like. Uh, the naval battles of the Civil War. I think those would be interesting to, to huh. try to play. Now, what about the time period? You know, that's without being the top three. I, I lately I, I've been a. Uh, I really like the future. <laughs> no, it's not the future. Uh, what's it called? The Seven Years. It, some people call it the Seven Years War, but I'm a just long time ago. The war. The uh, in a galaxy far, far away. Maybe, maybe science fiction. I don't know. I, I, I guess I should have read the question correctly. I thought he yeah. said of. Joe wrote his two answers down, and they're both they're, they're both, both contest, contest things. Contest 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 so uh, actually, um, best oh, time period. Dead air. Dead air. Dead air. Dead air. I never heard of dead air. Probably <laughs> science fiction, or or not science fiction. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the American Revolution. The American Revolution. There you go. All right. Well, uh, I didn't pull this one on you. You just didn't read the question. Right? You're right. I didn't read the question right. All right. After and that, then it says. What is your favorite, Tom, what's your favorite time period for a game theme? That one's hard. I'm not going to say Renaissance Italy or Renaissance <laughs> Europe. Anywhere near the Mediterranean Ocean. For me, it's like a three-way tie. I like the future a lot. I also like modern times. There's very few games that seem to be made about modern times. And I like the Wild West. There's some good games from the Wild West. Uh, I guess particularly Wild West. Gunslinger, but that's not. That's a war game. You I win. do like that kind of theme, though. Um, and then he asked me another question, too. He says, uh, if you had to play, if you had to have a real war game... And I believe I have played real war games, yeah, but okay. What battle or war would interest you the most? Now, this one was easy for me. I, I really like the theme of a bunch of defenders 
like, who fight off against all odds. Like, so like, I would like, like the Alamo. Alamo. The Alamo. Alamo would be one. And then I don't know how to pronounce this, but it says Dean Dean Fu. I oh, think that's how you say it. Dean Ben Fu. Is that, is it? That's the French when they fought in Vietnam, right? Right. And they were surrounded. Down. They actually, from what I read, they went and established a base trying to. There's a trap. Yeah, and they just, but they fought for, what, was it days or weeks? It was, it was a long, long time. time. So how about the Battle of Crigador in the, in, with MacArthur in the, the Philippines? Yeah, but, yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, in every single one of these battles, the defenders eventually lost. But it's still, I don't know, maybe you could play this game of the guys you take out before you lost. Sure. But it seems like in the movies, the defenders always end up winning. Not in those, no, not historical movies, but... Oh, you know. Gondor. <laughs> Gondor, there you go. Gondor, Gondor and, uh, That's right. Your and four guys can charge the 700 orcs and, <laughs> and, and chop your way through because no one can stick a sword in them as they're riding by. But those orcs. are the things that interest me most. I'm curious as to why there's never been too many acclaimed games made about sieges in general. You know, the Siege of Jerusalem is a really good game. But how about yeah. this? Oh, if they made a war game about the uh, the Turks sieging Constantinople, that's just a tremendous battle I've I read about in history. I probably I really enjoy that. Or something. I just don't know. All right. Now from our number one fan, Phil Yower. He says, what battle, war, or theme for Tom <laughs> do you think should get more attention from game designers? Interesting. Well, I, I, I thought about this for a while, and I thought, I thought an interesting one would be more real war games about biblical themes. I mean, there's a lot of biblical battles. I would like to see... You know, talk about sieges that you can't win. How about you want to play Jericho? And I'll take on, I'll be David. <laughs> yeah, I, I Not think, David, but uh, Joshua. I mean, biblical battles are, are pretty well uh, documented in the Bible. You think that they make some pretty good games about them. It would because... Although oh, maybe, maybe it would be like... How do you play the God card, though? Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and how do you... Who wants to be the, the people who get killed? You know? Yeah, who wants to play the, be, can, the Canaanites, right? Would it be right? wrong if, you know, Jericho didn't fall to the Israelites or something to that effect? Hmm. Maybe if you just played, I don't know. I, I think that'd be interesting. I'd like to see more dogfighting games too. I'm I'm gonna agree with Joe though. I think biblical themes are very under under seen in games. Period, and the ones that we do see are usually trash, a pile of potato peels. They're not, or a pile of potato peels. Oh my! <laughs> yeah. is, that, is that your new motto? Yes. If it's something bad, it's a pile of rotten potato peels. Okay. I made that mistake in the last episode, but we're gonna stick with it. I would really like to see some games, more games about dogfighting. I'd like to see some more ship-to-ship games, like Wooden Ships and Iron Men. That's a good game. I'd like to see something that's a little bit lighter than that. I don't know. I'm going to agree with Joe on this, too, except my, I think there should be more games that involve spaceships themselves. Not just space, oh, but actual like spaceships. Grand-scale outer space battles. Oh, I mean, we got Twilight Imperium 3, which is cool. That's not really a space and battle. And we got some really neat spaceships in Starfarers of Katarin. But there's not a whole lot of good space games beyond those. I mean, you just talked about Magblast, and okay, so I, I guess that's another one, but I don't know. I think space is an undervalued thing. If you're a designer and you're thinking about a game, and you think, hey, I wonder if I should do a trading game in medieval times. Don't. What is it? Come on. What is that fascination with the Mediterranean area? Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, there's good games made about it, but there's I think so many Euro games. I think we've done that theme to death now. Let's move on. I guess a Euro gamer could point their finger back at America and say, there's a lot of games about America. I guess there's not, though, is there? No, not as many as you think. Not as many Euro games. Not, not, yeah, not, I'm Although, sorry. They're not Euro games. I'm going to start calling them designer games. I, I, I guess that American games, especially those made by the mass markets in the 70s and 80s and 90s, are always about making money in some way. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Get as much money as you can, because whoever has the most money wins. <laughs> I was on eBay the other day, and I was looking at it, and, and eBay has defined Euro games now as designer games. And so should we just start calling them designer games? Oh, they have to call them that now? Yeah. Well, you know we follow eBay. <laughs> so, anyway, next question. Now, the next question from the same person is, what would a vacuum pick up in your carpet? <laughs> well, Mine would be breadcrumbs from my kids or cookie crumbs or something. But, oh, I think he means game pieces. I would, mine would pick up little pieces of, no, I can't say that. I was going to say chits. Well, you just did. <laughs> chits and uh, chits are the little war gaming uh, square cower, cardboard counters. Actually, and orcs. Pieces of orcs. Yeah. Arms. Joe but, does have all kinds of pieces of orcs. I, I, I play 40K with the soldiers, and uh, so I've got little arms and weapons and heads. Orc head. My wife many times has you know, yelled at me for, or my kids or whatever, been playing with pieces of orcs. 
for me, I think it it would be dice to a degree. I, when I was at Origins one year, I bought a thing of these minuscule, minuscule dice. I don't even know why I bought them. I think just because they're cool and I like dice. And they're really neat. My kids like them, but they, they're really small and they get all over the place. They're the same size as the dice that come in uh, the, the Pirates of the Spanish Main by WizKid. Those, those really, really dinky The little things. tiny dice, huh? Yeah. That, and maybe you find a counter here and there, but I'm, I'm really... And this question was probably inspired by my comment that Tom had the little life game, little men and women thing all over his house. <laughs> that was me, actually. I was in my carpet when I was a kid. Well, I don't know. Uh, but thanks, Phil, for your questions. You're listening to The Dice Tower at www.thedicetower.com with Tom Vassell and Joe Stedman. A couple more questions we have. Our, our next question, hey, it's for me. Yeah, this one here is what, from, Tom, from Scott. Yeah. All right, says, Tom, I know gaming is huge in Korea. He says he was once there for three weeks up at Camp Casey, which is near us, on an exercise, and he was amazed with all the Internet and uh, gaming cafes with the uh, lighted signs all over the place and all this. And he says that Korea has been uh, an ex- has an extensive set of homegrown computer games, especially online games. And that's true. There's quite a few Korean titles out there uh, that they play just here in Korea. And he says, but what about homegrown Korean product board games? Have you ever made uh, the transition over to? They have made the transition over to English, such as Fire in the Sky, which is our game contest, which came over from Japanese. Um, what about Euro games? Has there been any uh, like that? Well, I mean, Korean. We, we we've been talking about them recently, and I just saw they had a stand at, at Essen. But there's Lexio, which yeah. is the domino type style version of uh, the ladder there. ladder climbing Blade, games, yeah, game. four, etc. Uh, there's uh, Jamblo, which we haven't mentioned for a couple episodes. So. I like that game, and I feel really bad because I've had like 20 people ask me to pick them up a copy, but it's just not, it's just not practical. Maybe if Joe and I go to Origins this summer, yeah. we can persuade the makers of Jamblo to so ship us some a games few cases there, there. Yeah. and then if you want one, you can meet us there. But don't hold us to that because right. that would take some. More I'll tell you what, if you pay up. my way to Origins, I will bring some. I'll bring you a copy. Oh, that's a good idea. Yes, if you do that, we will. I'll bring them two. I'll bring you two. <laughs> In fact, if you only pay, if you just pay two hundred dollars worth of my plane fare, I'll bring you a copy of Gem Blow. We're only half kidding here. As as missionaries here, we don't we yeah. don't get a whole lot of money. So any little bit to get us back to America is nice to come visit every once in a while. Is this going to be a pleasure, Thon? We like Jerry. We're not going to get off the air. Do these people give us money? <laughs> oh wait, this is a downloadable thing. Yeah, oh man, we're not canceling their regular of scheduled program. Downloading. I was wondering why you, you played that little. You're listening to the Dice Tower. I mean, people. I think they realize they're listening to the Dice Tower. Well, it's in case. Are you, are you afraid someone's slipping through the channels and just you know? <laughs> well, it's in case someone's in a podcast. And I don't know. Yeah, anyway. It just makes it sound cooler. It does sound cool. Okay. All right. Our next question is from uh, okay. someone who wishes to remain anonymous, and they say. There are a lot of sports, but not many translate the games very well. That's very true. What sport do you think is right for a game conversion that you haven't seen done yet, and why is it right for a board game? Huh. Well, I don't know if there's any sport that I haven't seen done as a board game. I've never seen curling. Okay. Well, maybe, yeah, Kronk, 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 how do you pronounce that game? Krunkle? Hmm. What's that game with the big wooden game where you throw the, the disc across it? I don't know. Kronky? I, I haven't seen... Good board games made of many sports games, although Pizza Box Football was a good football game. It's a very good football game. I think I would like to see a game that's about drafting. Drafting? Yeah, trying to get the best players on your team. Oh, you mean like a, like a sports management uh, game? Football drafting, yeah. Hmm. I mean, they were talking about retheming the auction game Raw to make it a football drafting, and I thought that was a really cool idea, but hmm. apparently it didn't work. work. But I, I think a game about drafting would be pretty neat. How about a good game about golf? I don't know. I mean, I've played some decent games about golf. I got that Boxo Golf game with some... It, that was pretty cool. I mean, it was also more expensive than you we and I would ever pay We for. even played a game about paintballing once. Yeah. Uh, baseball game. I got Harry's Grand, Grand Slam Baseball. Soccer. Stratomatic. Oh, there's lots, of, there's lots of good soccer games. I think soccer just translates better to, to a board there's, game. There's lots of good soccer games? I saw a, a soccer chess game at Essen. Really? Oh, don't forget, we need to do our S report soon. Yeah, we got to do our SM report. Let's not put that off too long because it's going to take so long. Yeah, yeah. You just wait. Um, so that's that. Here's here's our next question. It's from Chris Severs, 
and this is for Joe. All right. He says, I'm a word gamer and have been for 20 years. Yikes. Double explanation point. I find now, however, that I'm getting bored by the big three. I still like them and play them regularly. Um, and he talks about a game. I won't say the game because I'm not trying to give anything away. However, I'm now actively branching out, having recently played and enjoyed other periods. Do you suffer from this condition? Have you tried the Musket and Pike series from GMT? They're really great and fun. I'd recommend that you and any other listeners give it a try. And he also wants us to play uh, What's Your Name, Scumbag. Awesome. That's my favorite song clip. Oh. oh, okay. Musket and Pike. I actually own the games, and they're still in shrink wrap. I just not have I have not had the opportunity to to play them. I would really like to play them. So maybe if I can convince Tom to play them. I don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about some GMT war games. They're not too hard. I can teach you. Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, he said maybe. I always say maybe because you never know. Uh, we have some games we have to play ourselves. I have a I whole do, pile of games but, that but need to be played. I guess the, the root of his question was, do I ever get sick of the big three? And honestly, I don't. But maybe I'm just one of those. Maybe I will 20 years. I've only been war gaming for about five, ten years now. I mean, really. Yeah, and only I'm seriously, I've only been seriously doing it for five years, six years. Now, now you listen, in ten years, me and Joe will do the Dice Tower reunion special. <laughs> if we never, like, when we were young. But maybe I'll burn out on the big three, but, man, I, there's just so much, even within the big three. There's hundreds of titles. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm still looking for that perfect game. What's your name, scumbag? Yeah. All right, there we did. We, 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 we played your... Your, your your clip that you love so much. <laughs> All right. Here's our last question for this show. It's from Gary Romain, and he says, I just recently started listening to you and Joe and think you have the best gaming podcast out there. Ooh, really? I mean, tell us more about that. Well, you know, what can we do? Is there other gaming mm-hmm. podcasts? Uh, honesty. Oh, that Mark, uh, what's his face? Oh. Yeah, actually, we... I always forget, like, there's Johnson, gaming right? Podcasts. Mark Johnson? We're going to actually talk about them in upcoming weeks. We're going we're gonna to play little clips from these people on our show. And they're going to play clips from us on their shows. Oh, yeah. Like cross-promotional stuff. Right, like when, when, uh, when uh, what's his face, Arnold from The Different Strokes, he went on Facts of Life. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, Something like that. <laughs> uh, here's, here's Gary's question. He says, I have an eight-year-old daughter who likes games but doesn't have the idea of using strategy and thinking ahead when she plays. What is a good way to teach her these skills? Are there any games that you would recommend? <sighs> good question for you, Tom. And also, he said, what's a good game for an eight-year-old girl? Well, I already said Walk the Dogs today. Um, Carcassonne's a good game for an eight-year-old girl. What? Um, Carcassonne? Yeah, because they put the puzzle piece together. And oh, but if you don't, Okay, I can see that. If you don't use the rule book, just make it like a puzzle. No, 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 no. Melody, my daughter... I have a hard time even today play playing that game with the fields and the farmers and all that. Okay, you, you can play, though, without the farmers. Oh. And that's a feasible way to play. Okay, well, maybe. Um, risk. A teacher risk teaching someone to think ahead. I can't think about chess. any good chess. way of doing I would teach, it. Teacher chess, but I can't think of any exact way to do it other than just keep playing games and you just learn. But and then I would point out and say, you know, because you did this here and here, now you can do this. Right. I would. I would really. Um, I, how old were you, Tom, when you learned chess? Um, eight, seven. I don't. Yeah. Know. I. I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't too too old. I was a kid. I was pretty. I was about that same age, and my my dad taught me chess. And it, I don't play a lot of chess now. I still love it, but I hardly ever play it. But there you go. I would say chess. All right. Well, we'll just we'll but, just accept that. But was the first half of her question? You said walk the dog. Yeah. Oh, for game, good games for eight year old girls. Walk the dog. Um, uh, sheer, leapfrog. Maybe sheer panic. Speaking of which, I just want to quickly say. The Sheer Panic sold out at Essen before the fair even started. Wow. They, uh, the fair starts on Thursday, and they had sold out by Wednesday. So, it's a bit. So if you won that contest, <laughs> you, count yourself you got lucky. yourself a good game. Yes, you did. Uh, a, a limited edition. And so maybe How many copies? Can, what was their print run? I think 550. 550, that's not Ooh, bad. I have one. Oh. You know what? And I don't, and I'm upset. Oh, well. I could put little like bloody spots on it, and make it like a, a casualty on a battlefield. <laughs> the sheep on All a right. miniature battlefield. And now, folks, it's time for our Essen report. Ooh, the Essen report! I've been looking forward to this segment yeah, because this is this is the only thing that people well, are looking at. Do we have a, do we have a sound bite to introduce this or anything? Um, I don't think of them, but we'll play this one. What's your name, scumbag? All right, I'm gonna play it in German. There you go. All right, first Joe will tell you about his, and then I'll tell you about mine. All right, my yeah. Essen report. Here goes Joe's. All right. Yeah, good. Okay. All right, Tom, what about yours? And this is mine. 
Oh, there good. You go. Interesting. See, that's, that, that is the best. Extra if you have any questions about our Essendon report, go ahead and email them to us. We'll talk about them next week. However, if you want a real one, Rick Thornquist has done a tremendous job. Yeah, he has pictures. Great pictures. And it just, it, it's good and bad. I mean, he does a really good job, but it's bad because I sit there and I just drool at all these cool new games. Uh, we have our correspondent, Shin Yu. Uh, he Ooh, actually went Shin. there. And I asked him about it, and he said he's a little too tired right now to write a whole thing out. Shin is a... The game of the fair was a game called Kalas. It's made by the same company who made E's, spelled Y-S, last year. Hmm. Shin Yu is a, is a Korean gamer. I think the best Korean gamer in the whole country. That's my personal opinion. That uh, He was with us for a few years. We played quite a few games together. And then he moved off to England to uh, go to some higher learning, higher education. I can't... I think he's working on his master's. And uh, him and his wife. And so he got the drive to Essen. Did he fly or drive, do you think? What did he say the name of the game was again? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. It's Kalos. Did I say Kalos? <laughs> Kalos. That's the guy. That's the Klingon god. Kalos. Well, that is, is it a big, way, I hope buy, if it's a game about Klingons, I will buy it. Some people are saying it's better than Puerto Rico. So. Well, that doesn't say much. So if it's a game about <laughs> Klingons, I will buy it. It's not about that's Klingons. That's a good under game Klingons versus the Federation in a grand right. scale war game. All Nothing right. to do with Starfleet Battles, which is a good game within itself. But Let's something. talk about our games that we've played this week. All right. Which, uh, Speaking it was of, kind of a slow week. We had a marriage conference at our church. Yeah. Did which, you, play, you bring any games? <laughs> yes, I did, and I wrote about that in my blog. Oh, that's right. Because people were mocking me for... Tom's rant. For bringing games. Yeah, in fact... I'm about to get into my rant mode. No rant mode. Okay. Just shut up! <laughs> Ticks me off. It ticks, ticks me off! Anyway, <laughs> so, um, we, I've actually, I got five games from Simply Fun to try out, and all five of them I like. But I think currently, Walk the Dog is, is really high up there, but another game called Drive, it's supposed to be two to four players. It reminds me a little bit of Spy. Is that like, like the, the Cars yeah. album? The Cars have an album called Drive. Yeah, and, it, and it reminds me of uh, Lost Cities to a degree. I, I really enjoyed it. It was one of those games where me and my wife just clicked off. We started playing, and then we got the strategies. And I, I foresee a lot of plays of, of Drive. Huh. Um, I haven't tried it with four players yet, but we'll see. I got in my uh, typical ASL and SK fill this week, probably three or four games, um, which I'm sure the ASL players must wonder how I can play so much. Well, remember, my ministry is with soldiers, and I play all the time. And it's, I know you're jealous, so you should just be a missionary, and you can play ASL all the time. And uh, what else? <laughs> I uh, played Moods, which is a party game that my wife really likes. And then I played my favorite of all the Carcassonne things, which I actually do actually kind of like, only because I've played it quite a few times now, which is Ark of the Covenant, which is a, a biblical-based... It's not biblical-based. It's just a tacked on biblical themes. I don't even think it's a Christian game or anything. But it changed to just enough rules in the Carcassonne where I think it's more enjoyable. The main thing is they got rid of the farmers and they use sheep and wolves, which I think are really cool. Anyway. Well, this weekend I'm playing games. I have some new ones I'm going to try out, so I'll get Joe to test them out with me. We're going to try and play that um, uh, game that uses miniatures as card, card cards as miniatures. Uh, we'll try that out. Alliances. I always think, what's the point of playing a miniatures game if you don't have miniatures? But we'll just try that. Anyway. We'll see how it works. And so, those are our games we played this week. And I guess... On with the show. Right. So... Uh, is this dead air? Yeah, this is dead air. <laughs> I, I just realized I pulled up the... I pulled, All right. I pulled up the long... Oh, the long okay. Play. One other game I played, I played that Star Trek exploration game again. And... uh I'm, I really, I really like it. West West End Games. It's a fun game. It's an old game, but okay. Now we're ready. All right. And now it's time for the weekly top ten list. All right. All right. Now, what someone, are our top ten? Someone 10 emailed us and said that last week uh, our games were games oh, that were right. that, that that we kind of dissed on on the uh, the mass market the mass market games. And in a way, we did. Kind of. We didn't have that many designer or war games on there. And so he, I, I read this question. He he requested that in the future we do uh, our our least or I think our, our most overrated or our biggest stinkers of the popularly accepted either designer games for you or war games for me. I thought that would be interesting to do. Yeah, we we, we may do that in the future. Like my 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 top ten 
most overrated war games and why. You know, something like that. Yes, but in, in honor of mass market games, this week we're doing our top ten party games. You which you can't deny they and, are and mass market. Most of them are mass market. There's a couple of them that are are uh, designer games or have a small, you know, made by smaller publishers. But we got some games made by the big boys here this time. Yeah, yeah. And so. Uh, before we get to our top ten, we'll talk about the ones that well, Tom, what is a, almost made it. Well, what, what exactly is a party game in case someone doesn't know? Uh, a party game is a game that you play at parties. That's my definition. I'm sticking to it. If you think a game I, I say is not a party game, then don't come to my parties. To me, a party game is a game that's just extremely light. You don't care if you win or lose, and it's more for the social aspect. That's, okay. That's, it, that's my I think it's a good definition. way. A party game is you don't care if you win. However, uh, Joe's number one party <laughs> game, I actually do care if I win, kind of, sort of, so... <laughs> and then, then again, we are a competitor, competitor, Tom and I. So we always, I do have a way of breaking party games so I can win. It's kind of a habit I have. Yeah. Anyway, so here's the games that almost made it. All right, first we have Boulder Dash, right. good game, twenty five words or less. I like that one because it forces you to give clues in very few words. Blink. Uh, hey, Boulder Dash is listed here twice. Is That's that because we both put it in? I think it's yeah, must have been. Anyway, Link. Um, imagine if. Imagine if it's a good game. Cluzzle, but we'll talk about that one later. Uh, Truth or Fib, which is, I have not played. Frazzle, The Touch. Now, you played Truth or Fib, Joe. That was where it gave you a question, and you had to either, you oh. had to either tell something that was true or false, and we all guessed whether you were right. telling the truth or not. Gotcha. It came in a lunchbox. Yeah, I remember that game. It was actually pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, Frazzle? I don't think I played that Frazzle's one. Frazzle's a game where you just shout out a word and, uh, uh, when you get a letter. Um, the Touch? The Touch is that game where you stick your hand in, and you feel around, and you're trying to pull pieces out. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Visualize. That's that one that gave me a headache, right? With the yeah, dice. Yeah, you roll these big, huge dice, and you're trying to. They have like they have little pictures on them, and you, you of inanimate objects or actions. And right. You try to, anyway, squint, which I thought was horrible. A squint, I like better than Pictionary because you can ah. use a little. Pic, you Pictionary can use a little is much more fun. Um, that's not saying much. Taboo. Yeah, everyone likes taboo. Everyone likes taboo. Outburst. Again, everyone, everyone likes, likes outburst. Um, what's it to you? What's it to you? You had five words, and you try and. Um, you're trying to put them in the same order as your partner in relevance. Like, is food more important than love, or which one's more important than email? And you, you know, you put them in order, and you're trying to match your partner. And then there's, you know, inevitable yelling because huh. your partner doesn't match you. Telepath is almost the same thing. Hmm. Get Paul that promotion. Uh, you're both just trying to spiel off the job for Paul. You, did you play that with us? Yeah, you did. I think I did. It wasn't too impressive to me. Coyote. Coyote, I like because you stick cards in your head and you can see everyone's card but yours. <laughs> That's dumb. I like it. Anyway, now now our real list. Our real list. Number 10. My number 10. <laughs> well, someone did email to say, Joe, it was funny. It was okay for Joe to laugh. All right, I'm going to get myself. My okay, my number 10 game me. is Picture Picture. I like Picture Picture. You put a big picture in the middle of the table. Everyone looks at it, and it's kind of like categories. You write down one thing for every letter of the alphabet that you see in that picture. And then if you write the same thing as someone else, you cross it off. The pictures included are really cool. You know, a huge a picture of a candy store, and it shows all different stuff all over it. Or a picture of a boy sitting in a pile of toys. My only problem with the game is I wish there was more pictures. You play too much, you've seen the same pictures over and over again. And also, sometimes people would start putting down body parts. A, arm. D, dentures. You know, it just after a while, it got kind of silly in that regard. But I really do like the game. I don't think it's produced anymore. They made another one called Scrutinize that was similar. Um, is, that like, is that like those books that you can buy and you had to stare at the picture of no, like no, no. all the toys and it's you like got to find the crow? Okay, yes, but this one you're not looking for anything. You're just looking for something that starts with each letter. Like Waldo. <laughs> kind of. All right. So that's my number 10, Picture Picture. My number 10 is, uh, I'll admit, part of it is nostalgia, but part of it is just a lot of fun. And part of it is self-identification. <sighs> yes, it's called Tom's, Tom's, and Tom's. No, it's called uh, Dweeps. Uh, Dweeps. <laughs> Dweeps. <laughs> See, I can't even say it right. Dweebs, Geeks, and Weirdos. This is a game from the sep- or from the 80s, and it's very dated. Um, basically, they took the game Truth Dare, Double Dare, Promise to Repeat. You, you played the game, Tom, when you were a teenager? No, I never did. Yeah, right. And they made it into an actual board game. Uh, it's got a dexterity aspect of the game where you have to flick little uh, little counters onto a little uh, basketball court type thing and see how close you can get. And the object of the game is to, to go from loser status, like a dweeb or a geek, to totally rad. And if you can be totally rad, then you're the winner. And on your turn, you flip over a card, 
and you have to do whatever the card says or whatever. And it's it's very it's fun to play with teenagers. It's actually to play with adults is is actually pretty fun too. I've done it a couple of times, and uh, you could probably pick it up on eBay for very cheap. So dweebs, geeks, and weirdos. And that's Joe's number ten. Number nine. nine number nine. nine. All right, my number nine <laughs> game is the big idea. In the big idea, you, you take some cards, put them together, and you make an invention. Uh, like maybe uh, a sexy uh, shoe shoe uh, horn or all kinds of weird things. I probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, I guess that was a bad combination. But then whatever combination you had to make, you had to sell it then. What well, exactly is a player. sexy shoe horn? <laughs> I don't know. I just had the first two things that came to my mind. <laughs> well, I, okay, I don't even want to go there. Say, say, say something else because I, 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 I got um, that stuck in my head. Uh, not... Um, a, a solar-powered lawnmower. A solar-powered lawnmower, okay. okay. Whatever, and then you had to sell it. And when you play the game with creative people, which I did, it's really <laughs> fun because the pitches people would make, and they'd say, well, you really need to buy this item because blah, 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 blah. And it was a lot of fun. It was fun. But I don't know if I'd play it with people who weren't creative. No, or people older than you. <laughs> All right. So my number nine is The Big Idea by Chia Pass Games. My number nine is uh, Barbarossa. And this is the... War game. No, not the war, not the war game. Uh, a family fun war game. No, uh, Barbarossa is the clay molding game that I did a, a discussion about in the last episode. Uh, you can play it with the original version up to six players. And truthfully, you can play with as many people as you want, really. If you put people on teams, you could you could expand the game. I don't know why you couldn't... Um, yeah, but it's it's not a it's not a it's not a raucous party game. It's more of a it's funny, but not it's kind of weird. When I it fits the definition of party game for me because I don't really care if I win or lose. I'm just having fun. It's really fun, and you you mold the clay and everything. And I would I would recommend it. They have a new version out, but it's only four player. Which... I try to win. <laughs> anyway, Joe's Joe says he doesn't try to win because he doesn't. Well, whatever, Tom. So. Joe's number nine is Barbarossa. I'm going to start using these quotes on you that people send in. Okay. Number eight. My number eight game is by Richard Garfield. Again, I think this one may be out of print. It's called What Were You Thinking? It's the game that we played in our show a couple times for contests where you try, you know, you turn, you, you pick a card and it says, uh, it asks like name five states in America. And you're trying to name five states that everyone else is going to pick. And so, you know, it, it makes the game a lot of fun. I enjoy it. it it's hilarious when someone picks five answers that no one else picks, and they're like, I thought everyone would say this, you know? And <laughs> so that brings out a lot of laughter, and the game's interesting because there's no winner. There's just one loser. As soon as one person loses, the game's over. Kind of like hearts. I guess. I, I, But I still like the game. My number eight is What Were You Thinking? My number eight is uh, Liar's Dice, and... Um you can play this with the uh, if you play the mass market version. You can play with uh, eight people. I think. I think it supports up to eight. Um, uh, I've seen it with six. I don't think I've ever seen it with eight. Maybe it is six. But once again, this is a game I don't really care if I win or not. It's just fun. You are bluffing. It's a pure bluffing game. All bluff. And it just makes for some funny, funny situations, especially when you get someone out of their element playing, and it's just fun. So uh, liars dice. I think everyone should have a copy of that game. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree there. I think everyone should have a copy. Very simple game. Number seven. My number seven game is Smarty Party. And Smarty Party is a huge kangaroo for me because I did not like Smarty Party that much when I first played it. But now that I played it more, it's really fun. Uh, maybe I just played the first couple of games with people that just didn't go over well. But you're trying to, you're trying, you get a topic and it's kind of like Outburst where you, or, or Family Feud where you, you know, ten things you find in a coffee store. So someone says something. And then you have to say something that they haven't said so far. And it keeps going around the table. And every time that you can't say something, you get some points. And then whoever gets the most points loses. Whoever has the least points wins. And so, uh, Smarty Party is actually a pretty good game. Only problem is if you get a topic that you know nothing about. But Smarty Party is my number seven. Hmm. My number seven is the classic game, Werewolf. And uh, Werewolf's great with a, with a group of people and large with a large group. And uh, Werewolf is a game where... If you're not familiar with it, it's um, there's no real board involved. This is just a uh, how would you describe it, Tom? It's uh, 
It's a head game, mind game. I don't know. Yeah, it, 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 it's a mind slash negotiation game where, where you're a, trying to just stay alive. Yeah, there's a group of everyone takes the role of a villager except for one or two people are secretly werewolves. And the point of the game is try to hunt down the werewolves before the werewolves secretly kill everybody else. The, the, the problem with the game is you have to have at least you have to have a moderator, so one person can't play. But it's kind of fun to be the moderator too. So a werewolf. Um, you can get the rules to it online. It's just a great, great game. There's a mafia version too. Yeah. In fact, someone asked me how to retheme Werewolf. My instant reply to that is mafia. But I think you could, you, you, if you really thought hard about it, you could retheme it any way. Any way you want. I rethemed it for my class. I made it nerds, nerds and jocks. <laughs> All right. Number six. My number six game is Spinergy. Spinergy is probably the biggest party game I own because it has this huge spinner and you put three rings on you spin you get three words then you draw a topic and everyone has to write about that topic uh using those three words and then one person is trying to guess other words that people are going to use in their written thing when used with creative people spinergy is a is a whole lot of fun you know write a love poem using the word octopus chocolate and uh spain and that just makes for some interesting things Chocolate octopus. Stop. Just go on. Move on. <laughs> I was never saying I was going to give you a love poem, Tom. Man, I can't I don't believe. What a love poem from you. <laughs> All right, number six is uh, True Colors. Now, True Colors is a game that I played with Tom. He owns it. Um, this is an evil game. It's, I, a, I know it's so fun, though. In this game, basically, uh, a question will be asked of the group, and then you have to basically everyone simultaneously uh, puts cards down, voting. For who they think that person... That, who is the smartest person? Who that question closely represents. So the question would be like, who is the ugliest person here? And so everyone puts other cards down. We flip them over and we notice that everyone voted for Tom. And so everyone's laughing. Ho, ho, ho. No, before we flip them over, you have to guess how many people voted for you. Yeah, you, then you vote. You look at the, Yeah, you have to guess how many people voted for you. you guess, did I get most of the votes, some of the votes, or none of the votes? So I, so it's, it's just, it's really, it, it makes for some interesting situations because women, if you get to play with, a, with women, they'll be like giving each other the evil eye. Oh, so you just said a gender statement. Now we're going to get sued. A gender statement. Yeah, you said. I'm sorry, but men and women are different. <laughs> hey, just but, like ASL and ASL starter kit are different. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> I, I said I wasn't going to talk about ASL and ASL starter kit and the difference between the two on this show, so I won't. Men are from ASL, women are from ASL SK. Is that <laughs> anyway, uh, do not play this game with anyone who's thin skinned. Yeah, definitely because not. But if, if someone's only... there and they say, I'm not a tight wad, and everyone votes for them, some people are really offended. There's by more that. pointed questions. Like, who, which, 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 there's some really evil questions. Like, which person here thinks that they're uh, the smartest, or what, who would you. Who would be, you trust your kids to if you died? And stuff like that. Yeah, so it, only play with close friends and only if you have a good attitude. But it's a great game. Yeah, I like it a lot. It, it almost it almost made my list. Number five. My number five game is Talking Tango. The object is simple. Two people together are giving a clue to everyone else, except they have to do every other word. So if we're saying the clue word is apple, I might say, uh, and then Joe would say fruit, and then I'd say that, and he would say is, and I would say red. And everyone say Apple. Did we had a game out of that? Yeah. We used to play that when we were kids. Just but the fun. game is funny because when two people are going in opposite directions on the word, and one person is saying one meaning and the other person is saying the other meaning, and it just turns out to be a tango. I guess so. So my number five game is Talking Tango. I'm not going to say the name of my number five. I'm just going to let you talk about it because it's your number one game. So oh, I'm not even going to say the that's name. That's awfully one. nice of you. Number four. Our number four game is actually the same. Yes, interesting. You say the first word, I'll say the second. Okay, Beyond? Boulder Dash. <laughs> beyond Boulder Dash. I like Boulder Dash a lot. Oh, a whole lot. But Beyond Boulder Dash it's made much me better. so much more fun. When you add movies and, and pop, you know, popular. And Joe liked the date, because you could try yeah. and see how close you could get to something historical happening on that date. Right, the dates aspect was fun, especially for a history person. But and the movie part where you made a plot for a movie that no one has probably ever seen, and then... Some B movie, right? The, you had to guess the plot, and the plots on the cards are so silly, and the plots that people make well, up well, the way the game, even silly. I'm sure you put, this game has been around for years, but the game is just you, you get something in, and you have to decide either to read the real term where, or the real thing with the name of the movie, and I'll give you the plot, or you make up one, and people have to guess whether or not you're lying or telling the truth. That's malarkey. Well, what is it? How do you, how do you play it? I don't know what I don't know what you're talking about. No, I mean, Beyond Boulder Dash, it's you... No. What, how, you, how does the game play? 
How does the game play? Yeah. Okay. When it's your turn, you write down the real definition. Everyone else makes up the definition. Right, right, right. That's right. And, and you shuffle yeah, them yeah, and yeah. you read them and people you have to guess which right. one is the and real if, definition. If, uh, my whole point of that was if you can get people who are, 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 are imaginative or people that have half of intelligence to them, it's, it can be really funny. So... Don't play with Tom. I agree. Beyond Balladash is a lot of fun. I don't agree with that last statement of Joe's. <laughs> but either way, our number four game is Beyond Balderdash. Number three. I'm actually, I know Joe's going to disagree with me on this oh, one. Oh, yeah. Because my number three game is Apples to Apples. Ugh, turkey, turkey, turkey. well turkey. in every situation I've been in. Every time I take it, people enjoy it. For once. You, you, Everyone has a hand of nine cards. Someone throws a card on the table that says, like, silly. You pick a card from your hand. You put it in the middle. They mix them up. And then the judge decides which card they pick. If they pick your card, you get a point. That's the game. Hmm. I think it's falling flat for Joe. Hmm. But my number three game is Apples to Apples. All right. Uh, it's a good game. All right. My number three game is Moods. And, and Moods is a good game. Moods is a game where it's, it makes for some funny situations because you put out uh, different moods that people go through, like anger, happiness, scared, and you then roll a die and you have to draw a card and you have to read a sentence with that particular mood that you know in secret, and everyone else has to guess what mood you're trying to convey. And so you may get a sentence like, Tom, you look really nice today. And you have to say it in a anger, you know, a scared way. That, that makes for a, you know, Tom, you, you look really, really nice today. Yeah, it, there's some really funny stuff. I can't imagine being scared of Tom, so. Yeah, well, that's because he hasn't played me in games recently. <laughs> Whatever. All right, so the, Joe's number three game is what? Moods. Number two. I'm actually not going to say my number two game because it's Joe's number one. There you go. So what are yours? My number two game is Pit. And I also put on this Spoons, which basically to me they're the same game. They're games where everyone is just chaotic. There's yelling and shouting and jumping. And and Pit is a stock market trading game. And uh, you're you're all not numbers of trades that you want. You want to be the first person to corner the market. If you've never played Pit, you need to get a chance and play it. Buy it. You can buy it really cheap at Toys R Us or or Walmart or wherever. You can you can get it there. Um, Pit. Now this also brought to mind a, a game I was going to put, but I forgot the name of it too. So what's that game that you have where you say um, you say like what's your name? What, what you talking about, Willis? What you talking about, Willis? And it's that, it's quote, Are you crazy? Are you crazy? That is a crazy game, but it's really fun. <laughs> it was. I, I I like Are You Crazy, and maybe it would maybe it would be good for a, a party game, but. I mean, that's chaotic. it's so chaotic. That's it's why like I, playing that's, Uno, but you can interrupt it any time you want, and you have to shout phrases at the same time. It, 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 like I said, it reminded me. Really I, I thought of this when I said Pit because it's just a real chaotic game, and Pit's a very chaotic game. But uh, it's the only game that I've ever had my pastor play. We've been here for a couple of years now. That's true, and he said he never plays board games, but he did play Pit. He played Pit, and it was really funny watching my distinguished pastor. Actually, he's not really that distinguished, but <laughs> out there yelling for uh, stock market, stock market game. And finally, number one. <laughs> and our number one, you made it almost the whole way through, <laughs> that, Joe. That, that, but finally, that one, that one's the funniest. I mean, it has to be. All right. Made. All right. Uh, our number one party games, mine is Why Did the Chicken? I think Why Did the Chicken is just a great game. You have a random riddle. Which Everyone is, answers it in the funniest way they can, and the judge picks the funniest answer. Right. was my number five game. Yeah, that's Joe's number five, my number one. I just really enjoy it. It's you know, it's a hard choice for me to pick between this and my number two game, but I, I finally had to get a nod to this one. doesn't work in every situation like Apple's Apple's does, but it's still a great game. Right. Why did the chicken? Why did the chicken? My number one game is Time's Up, and uh, I chose Time's Up over Why the Chicken. They're very similar, but I chose time up, Time's Up because it's more structured. Why the chicken? There's to be a little bit less structure to the game, and I like the structure of Time's Up. It's got specific rules. You know what you're, you know, if... I like that aspect of the game. By the way, Time's Up was my number two game. Right. And it's Time's Up's like a, a modern-day version of charades, but there's three different tiers of the game where you start off where you try to get your partner to guess, and you can say anything you want, except for there's certain rules in there. Second time you play the second round, then you can only say one word, and the third round is completely charades, and you can only you know make oh, actions and all that. And we've mentioned this in the show before, but just some of the funniest moments yeah. ever come from this game. Every time I play, and every time... Someone will say something 
wrong about a person, and there'll be a clue associated with that person for the rest of that game. Doesn't matter, right? And it doesn't matter that it's someone wrong or would, right. Someone would misread it and say it's, the word is like Abraham Lincoln, but they made a may have misread it and they they think of. Abraham the prophet. So there's like the prophet, the prophet. And so for the rest of the game, Abraham Lincoln's a prophet. Right. Right. And that's why Time's Up is fun. It's just really fun. Be- before we leave these party games, I'd like to say, I think people who, sometimes people say, oh, they're just party games. But, you know, party games fit the spot sometimes better than no other game can. I I have played some great games, my favorite games, uh, Duel of Ages, Cosmic Encounter. But some of my best memories of gaming ever come from party games. They really do. Party you, games are more socially acceptable, too. And you can get people, yeah, I was just say, you can get people to play party games that you can't get to play many other games. And so, don't knock party games, they're fun. Now, if party games are all you play, I, I say try to move on, up and play some other games. But if you are playing those other games, don't, don't not play a party game because they're, it's just a good way to have fun. And that's what games all are all about. Party games are cheap, too. You can find most of these games, not most, you can find at least half these games. At Barnes and Nobles in February after the Christmas sales, you get yeah. them for really cheap prices. Right. <laughs> That's where I got most of mine. So um, don't forget to enter our contest. Yeah, we made it past twenty episodes. Uh, we're we're working on. That means brother can season two now for a sitcom. Oh, that's right, twenty-one episodes. <laughs> so so now we have to leave you with a cliffhanger. So you'll hear this bang and Joe gas, and then you'll wonder, did right. Joe survive to the next? I like this. I gave you this one tagline I thought was funny. Right? It's Tom's. Tom's new tagline was, uh, "And you thought he was a nice guy until you heard this podcast." <laughs> and then Joe's tagline is, "You never thought he was a nice guy." <laughs> <laughs> that was from uh, Ian Cheyenne or Cheyenne. Yeah, he's gonna get a point from Joe for that. Uh, one. That's a good one. So actually, I remember liking that one too. I just didn't know if Joe would. <laughs> well. I am a nice guy. This guy get to know me. Sorry we didn't have as many segments in this episode. They will be returning in our next. We just had a lot of good questions. We just want to get some of these questions, right? And what's our next uh, top ten list going to be, Tom? We haven't decided yet. We haven't but decided. But I think, I think our next top ten list is going to be a split one where Joe focuses on a specific right, right. So genre of war games. You've, and you've, I you've got, on a specific if genre. you listen to this show within the next 48 hours, you may be able to influence our decision on a top ten list. That's true. <laughs> because we'll, we'll we'll make up our minds before the weekend is over. But don't forget to enter our contest. There's still plenty of time. It's not hard, and you get a free game out of it. I mean, how can you beat that? And even if you don't like the game, which I know you will, it's like Tom has said, it's good trading fodder. Well, either way. Uh, until next week, this is Tom Vassell. And I'm Joe Stedman. And Tom forgot to push the button. Oh, <laughs> Did we have the same problem last week? Why won't this work? Should this I, one's not playing. Should I just sing? No. But <laughs> keep, keep on. Play something else. Keep them on the line, Joe. Yeah, just play something else. Thanks for listening to today's show. And there you go. Um, a couple things about this. First of all, my party games list has changed quite a bit from this point in time. Uh, but... This is our first mention of Kalis, which was pretty hyped for a while. Now, not quite so much. We mentioned bringing Gemblo to Origins in this episode, and while that was a good dream, I actually did bring in uh, six copies, but I gave them to different people who would uh, review the game. The designer gave me several of those. Um, we mentioned Dice Towers in here. One thing I found interesting in this show was we talked about science fiction games and how I wish that there were more of them. And, you know, really, I, I, I still do wish there was more science fiction games, but I really can't complain about this this past year, 2008, with Android and Cosmic Encounter being re-released and Battlestar Galactica and Galaxy Trucker. And, and there's just so many sci-fi games now, and that's a theme that I'm still not even remotely tired of. It has a long ways to go before it catches up to... Uh, trading in the Mediterranean or building a castle or something like that. But it is good to see more sci-fi, especially space games, being made. Although it still would be fun to see a really simplistic yet strategic and entertaining space war game, I guess, or light war game, maybe along the lines of Nexus Ops. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. Uh, We mentioned some dice towers in this show, like I said, but there's uh, better ones ever since then, Vixen Tour, make some tremendous ones. You can get 
a small portable one from Blue Panther Games. And, of course, you can always donate to our show. If you go to www.thedicetower.com, you can see how you can donate to our show. And if you donate $25 or more, we'll send you one of our custom dice boots, a clear dice boot with the Dice Tower logo on it. It's a new year. We have new expenses for both the audio and the video podcast. And if you'd like to donate to help defray that, we'd really appreciate it. Well, anyway, I guess that's enough about this show. I'll try to get episode 22 out maybe in two or three weeks. But the next episodes you're going to be listening to are going to be episodes 138 and 139. And I'm telling you, there's some pretty interesting things that some of these uh, companies told me about what's coming in 2009. And so you want to check back for then. Until then, this is Tom Vassell, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed this show, we ask you to check out the website, www.thedicetower.com, for more information about us and about the games we love. We'd like to thank Your Move Games for their sponsorship. Check out www.yourmovegames.com to find out why Battleground Fantasy Warfare made Tom's top ten games of all time, or join in the discussion on their forums. Until next week, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been listening to The Dice Tower.